Well, Matthew, so we want to look at the, the demonization and the deception of Christians because what Satan tries to do and what he is really working hard at... Did you have, Jane says, where's that person? I'll go witness. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'll take me there now. The demonization and the deception of Christians, because what Satan does best is deceive. Yes, he lies. He's the father of lies. Well, a deception is, is, is a lie. And so what he is trying to do is get Christians to, let's put it this way, relax. Quit being so uptight, whatever. Um, so that we, you know, don't worry about some of this stuff. And, that, and that's why I think some of this has risen up with um, uh, uh, teaching that says, oh, don't worry about prophecy. Prophecy doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, prophecy very much matters. There's so yeah. much of the Bible devoted to it, it absolutely does matter. Um, so we're in this time of heightened deception. And Jesus says this in Matthew 12, verses 43 through 45. It says, now, when the unclean spirit goes out of a man, it passes through waterless places looking or seeking rest, and it does not find it. Then it says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when it comes, it finds it unoccupied, swept and put in order. Then it goes and takes along with it seven other spirits, more wicked than itself, and they go in and live there. And the last state of that man becomes worse than the first. That is the way it also shall be with this evil generation. So in this question of whether or not, you know, um, possession or oppression, possession, and, and the falling away of a Christian, can, can a Christian separate themselves from their relationship with God? And I think the Bible is clear on this. And I think this is one of those, those verses when you connect with some of the other things. And this is Jesus saying, yeah. That it could get really bad, and not only that, it's going to be worse than it was before in that sense. So any believer, let's put it this way, any believer can and will be oppressed by the enemy. If you, if I, if anyone has declared, I am a follower of Jesus Christ, you have just put a target on your back because the enemy of our soul is not going to quit trying to take us out. That is oppression in and of itself. Look at Job. Job was a righteous man, and yet he was oppressed heavily by the devil. And we, too, are going to be pushed around by the devil. He's going to try to mess us over. He's going to try to put little things here, little things there. It might start out with frustration that makes us angry. Well, what does the Bible say? It says, be angry and sin not. So what do you do with that anger? Well, if you let it fester, if we let it go, if we don't, put our head, you know, take every thought captive, you know, he's, he's just trying to find an end. He's just trying to find a way in. Um, think of it this way. There's, there's, um, I, and I'm going to talk a little bit over my head. I just know enough of it to make this, this analogy here. But there are, there are, uh, in other countries, and I'm sure we have countries with hackers, you know, there's the, there's a whole people, they're so smart with computers, they're trying to find a way to hack into somebody else's firewall and all that stuff. And, and, and they have it. And this is what Satan's doing. He's just trying to hack in. What can I get? What, what can I do to try to... Is there, a, is there a soft spot with that Christian? What can I do to kind of get through there? And that's what he's trying to do. And that in itself, itself there is, is, is um, what I would call oppression. He, you know, he's always going to try. He's the enemy of our soul and he's the enemy of God. And if we are a friend of God, he, Satan is our enemy from here till Jesus comes back, or forever, for that matter. So that is oppression. Satan works to keep people from becoming believers as well. Satan is so opposed to God in every way, he wants to separate believers and also keep people from becoming believers. So he is very active in the work to try to stop people from, from whether it's coming to church or... or uh, you know, living for the Lord or professing their faith or whatever it happens to be, he's going to keep working on people. So a, a, a believer uh, needs to know, I mean, we're, this, is a fight, this is a fight we're going to have till the day we go home or Jesus comes back. This is, this is the way this is. And I wish it wasn't that way because sometimes it gets, I get tired of fighting. 
Um, but and I, like I said, I should have known better after being three days in a revival that you know I was going to get pushed around a little today. It's yeah. like ah. So and it wasn't anything bad. It was just frustrations, and it's like oh now I'm aggravated, and now I'm right on the verge of not thinking righteous thoughts. <laughs> but I can't tell this. I can't say what I'm really thinking. You know, not that it was bad. It's just like I don't want to be negative in that sense. So. But that's what he does. Just little little place here, little place there, he tries to get through it. So a believer, though, who has fallen away, all right? So let's deal with that because believers can fall away. If we go, like this article was talking about, uh, soft in certain areas, the cares of life or, or any other area, Satan's looking for a way in. So if a believer who has fallen away or has been shipwrecked in their faith, who stopped following Christ, if they've separated from themselves from the relationship with him, in that separation, demons have the opportunity to overtake that person. They're looking for a way back into that house. And they said, if I can get back in there, I'm bringing some reinforcements with me. And so with that, if the separation is severe enough or lasts over a long period of time, that the door of that life is open and unprotected from the enemy. So look what, the, I mean, go back to that verse there in Matthew. Uh, it, it, it finds it unoccupied, swept, and put in order. Well, that looks like a life that where chaos has, has been taken out and there's order, but there's, there's no one protecting the door. Right. There's no one, there's, they've, said, they've compromised some area. That's the way I see this. You know, that, that the cares of life have, have compromised or there's some, some thing that they're allowing to, to, uh, to open the door for Satan. And he's looking and going, oh, I can get in there now. And, yeah. Uh, kind of deviate a little bit. Sure. Uh, question. Uh, some time ago you mentioned or shared with us a friend of yours that had shared with you that he didn't want you to yeah. contact him. And uh, how is that? I don't know. My question is, in regard <clears throat> to what you're, you're talking about, is uh, is anybody praying for him? Yeah. I, I mean, I am. I have asked around. Um, nobody knows what's happened or where he's at. He's 412. The threefold cord is not easily broken. Yeah. And sure, like going with what you're saying, the devil's, he's after this young man. Yeah. In a big way, it sounds like. Yeah. And I just wondered how many are standing in the gap for him while he can't stand for himself. Yeah. And and here's what I don't know in that scenario, like what what was the open door? I don't know what happened, you know. There is some other there's something there that that he made one comment one time, I poked a little bit, the conversation ended and I never did find out more. Um what was going on? He talked about there's this he talked about a darkness and um, never really got an answer on that. So I don't know. I don't know who was around him. I don't know who he, you know, who was praying with him. I don't know if he had two other cord, if cord, you know, three strands. I don't know if he had two other strands. Around. Nobody else could. We could. And he doesn't have to, even though he didn't want your help, he doesn't have to know that we're... Oh, absolutely. That we stand in the gap for him. Yeah. His family. And I pray that that somebody can get to him, you know, mm -hmm. um, and pray that somebody will will help restore him some way, shape, or form. I believe that God can make a way where there doesn't seem to be any way for us to see. Him. Yeah, yeah. All we have to do is just give it to God. Absolutely. Okay, that's all. I've no, got. but but that's and it's a great point. Be, you know, to the to the sense that that Satan works really hard. I think on those who are leaders, pastors, you know, uh, missionaries, and he's going to try to take them out. You know, um, and you do have to be you have to have guardrails up all the time, and you have to have some people around you 
yes. you know, um, to pray with you and to go just somebody just to have an ear so you can go dump if you need to dump, you know. Um, I'm thankful. I've always had that. I've had that before I started pastoring, you know. Um, I've always had that around me, so I'm very blessed in that way. But um, I've got more people now, which is even better. So. I've said before, but I thank you and Bob and Mike and Steve and Chris, uh, anybody in the leadership position in this church, you're the ones. If you take out the general, uh, if you had a choice between a private and a, and a general, you'd go for the, the ranking person. Yeah. Yeah. And then you'll cause chaos. Yeah. Well, that, and that's what's happened. And look how many, how many churches around the country, particularly these large, these huge mega churches, and and in almost every case, there's been some kind of moral compromise, mm -hmm. you know, in one way, shape, or form, um, in that. And it's just, it's just crazy the amount of that's happened. But it, it shows you the intensity of the battle. And uh, yes, I today at the sermon the funeral service the guy talked about when things aren't going right and when things things like this happen and they cause frustration and, and you're worried and you don't know and all this and he read what he read was Psalms 46 10 yeah. mm -hmm. and all it says is be still be still and know that I am God yeah. in other words I got it yes yeah that puts it. That puts all that in in a nutshell. It's more than whoever you're talking about needs. I yeah. Mean, it it it's all he needs or she needs. But you know. He's and he's talking about a friend of mine who was a pastor in Indiana. His name is Rudy, and brilliant, absolutely brilliant man. And um, I don't know what happened, but something happened. Um, and of course, he was a guy that I had not only texted with, but had gotten to know through association in the churches of God and kind of became really, you know, a good long distance friend. And, and, uh, um, and I don't know what happened last summer, but something happened. And, and about Christmas time, um, I'm sending out scriptures, you know, and, and he said, stop texting me. And I said something to the effect of, uh, Hey man, if you want to talk, cause I tried to talk, you know, with him a couple times, and I said, "Hey man, if you want, no, stop texting me." And I just, mm -hmm. okay, I haven't texted with him since. So, but anyway, so but it just is heartbreaking because man, the dude is brilliant. Yeah. He's just flat brilliant, and um, that may have been the case. Could have been, it could have been. I don't know what happened, but it's troubling to know that, you know, to see so many. Uh, pastors, leaders, you know, uh, people that God has given a huge stage or platform, um, you know, that have been caught up in some some stuff where it's disqualified them. And I don't want to, you know, overly criticize anyone, but this is how Satan works. You know, he's out for keeps, but God is greater. You know, greater than he who is who greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. But we have to access that power. You know. Keep praying for Rudy. Absolutely. Keep praying for Rudy. Um, Unger points out that oppression, and on page 142 of his book, I'm just going to reference this. You can, can get in there and read it if you'd like. Uh, oppression can come in mild, medium, and severe forms. Um, so that's oppression. But then possession. Possession is um, best illustrated in Mark chapter 5. So if you want to turn your Bible to Mark chapter 5, and this is the story of the demoniac out there in the, living in the cemetery, so to speak. And um, I want to spend just a little bit of time reading that. And Mike, if you wouldn't mind sure. to read this, uh, it's Mark chapter 5, verses 1 through 20. And then we'll talk about this. They went across the lake to the region of the Gerasenes, 
When Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an evil spirit came from the tombs to meet him. This man lived in the tombs, and no one could bind him any more, not even with a chain, for he had often been chained hand and foot, but he tore the chains apart and broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and in the hills he would cry out and cut himself the stones. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell on his knees in front of him. He shouted at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? Swear to God that you won't torture me. For Jesus had said to him, Come out of this man, you evil spirit. Then Jesus asked him, What is your name? My name is Legion, he replied, for we are many. And he begged Jesus again and again not to send them out of the area. Of the area. A large herd of pigs was feeding on the nearby hillside. The demons begged Jesus, Send us among the pigs. Allow us to go into them. He gave them permission, and the evil spirit came out and went into the pigs. The herd, about 2,000 in number, rushed down the steep bank into the lake and were drowned. More? Yeah, all the way down to all 20. Down to 20? Yeah. Okay. Those tending the pigs ran off and reported this in the town and the countryside, and the people went out to see what had happened. When they came to Jesus, they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons sitting there, dressed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Those who had seen, seen it told the people what had happened to the demon-possessed man and told about the pigs as well. Then the people began to plead with Jesus to leave their region. As Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him. Jesus did not let him, but said, Go home to your family and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. So the man went away and began to tell in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him, and all the people were amazed. Hmm. Unger goes deep and wide on that story. Um, and we, I won't do that tonight. I just want to bring up something here. Um, he says the, the, the body of a human being uh, has been infiltrated and inhabited by one or more demons who control the physical decisions and activities of that person. Possession, he says, does not happen to a believer or follower of Jesus Christ because that believer has been filled with the Holy Spirit. With that filling, the follower cannot be taken. Right, so so if you are filled with the Holy Spirit, you cannot be filled with the devil. So, if someone who has fallen away from the Lord, though, if someone who says, "Yeah, I used to be a Christian," okay, I mean there there is that. And so um, it says here the uh, I'm, this is a summary of my this is my summary from both Dr. Ed Murphy and Dr. Unger's work here. It says the opportunity to possess a human apparently can come at any time in life, um, according to Dr. Ed Murphy in his work, The Handbook for Spiritual War, uh, Warfare, and Dr. Merrill Unger in his works, What Demons Can Do. Possession, particularly of children, happen uh, with severe abuse even at an early age. So there is a time when, when they're unprotected. You know, A person who is not a Christian and can be unprotected. So, so all of this, we see this happening in our culture, mm -hmm. that that a boy can say, oh, I, I want to be a girl, or a girl says, I can be a boy, and that is not what God intended, right? God says, I made male, I made female, and I made you the way you're special, you know, each, each child. And so with this so openly happening, um, this is opening the door, This what's going on in our culture, to all kinds of things. And I and I think particularly we're going to look at this thing with Noah again tonight. The door to possession is open because of these things that we're allowing. I think that we don't really realize some of the things that are going on in the movies, even in the cartoons. In uh, in my grandkids' house, there's certain cartoons that have now been as we say, I I say it this way, have been banded they have been banded from the house. We can't watch that cartoon anymore because they're talking about this one has two mommies or this one has two daddies. And, you know, so just in that level at this preschool age, they're telling us that trying to make it look like 
it's okay, which is in total opposition to what God says is okay. And at some point, we got to take a stand that says, if God says this is how he created it, male and he, female, he created them, we're with God on that. Miraculously, you are, you are fearfully and wonderfully made, the Bible says. You are created in the image of God. Male and he, female, he created them. He's given us all this inspired by God, so to speak, in who we are. And Satan comes along and tries to say, oh, no, 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 no. You, can, you know, this is, this is wrong, that's wrong, this is wrong, that's wrong. And Satan is, is working in what? In total opposition to what God says is good. Satan has thrown that out. And so how can these little children, and I think there's a heavy, heavy assault on children and families. You know I've said that before. But I think that, that this is how this is happening. And the door to possession is also open because of some of the things that we're allowing in, in our culture or allowing ourselves or our kids to watch. The occult, uh, witchcraft stories, um, st stuff like that, uh, fortune telling, crystals, alcohol, drugs, all of this stuff now is opening the door for Satan to start making an infiltration in there even before these kids some of them get old enough to even become what we call the age of accountability to profess Jesus as Lord. All of a sudden, there's you know there's so much junk in there um, that it has it has infiltrated them to to the point where if if mom and dad, granddad and grandma, if you aren't watching the door of what goes and is said in your home, what is done in your home, you may be opening. Not I'm not saying you are, but you may be opening the door to something that, that just one little thing that can that can get to one of these kids. So, thoughts on any of that? Yeah. There's a film clip out that there's a new movie from Hollywood uh, called The Pope's Exorcist. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, the actor that stars in it, uh, The Exorcist, is Russell Crowe. He played in a movie. I didn't see the movie, but... What I did see of it, he took broad liberties with the story of Noah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, is what I watched it is I watched about two or three. They give it about a two or three minute clip. He comes into a house and the young man's possessed, and he says, "My name is Legion." Mm -hmm. And Russell Crowe plays a back and forth with the devil or whatever's in this young man and they bring in a pig and he goes from the young man to the pig and then they immediately kill the pig and uh, only not, you can only guess at what, what the rest of the movie would be mm -hmm. about, but I mean it's crazy yeah I mean, it is crazy, and some of the movies are really, are really blatant and and creepy. I mean, the commercials for them are creepy. Um, so, uh, Doctor Unger declares this, though he says victory is always certain when it comes to possession, and he talks a great deal about about uh, coming in opposition to people who have been possessed. Okay, uh, in there. And he says, victory is always certain in the name of Jesus. So it may take time. And he points out, too, that Jesus did it right then. Yeah. But with us, we're not Jesus. So it might take longer. It might take. But he talks about some things in here that, that I'm not going to get into tonight. But confronting, he, he always asks the name like Jesus did. What is your name? And, and um so in, in his confrontation with people who are demon-possessed, he, he says they, they go straight for that. And he talks about people who have been, um, who have, have um, or at least seemingly been Christian. Um, but he talks particularly in here about one young man who had left the door open. There are some things in his life that were compromised that he did not, as a Christian, walk away from. And it opened the door, just like it says in Matthew. It opened the door for the devil to get back in. And um, so it, that one, he said, took some time. Uh, and this, that was in chapter 10. 
So I, I, there's a lot of stuff here I am learning. Um, and I will tell you straight up that that's about as deep as I can take you on this because I'm still processing a lot of the things that he has in here. I would encourage you to get this book and um, to read through it. Uh, it will challenge you and it take you deeper probably than you could even imagine because it's taken me deeper than, than some things I could even imagine. Um, so, he, but Dr. Unger says this on page 150, and I wanted to point out a couple of things he says here. He says this, when a person is saved uh, out of centuries of entrenched paganism, and he's talking about some of these, these countries, these foreign countries, so where there has been generations of paganism and someone comes out of that, he says, if that person doesn't separate himself completely from witchcraft and sin, there's a great risk of being demonized again because you've left the door open. And I think that aligns right with what Jesus said. You know, that demon will come back and says, oh, look at here, the house is empty. I'm coming back. So there, he says that, and then he also says, um, uh, the overwhelming experience um, of, of these people, who, and he's talking about this one particular person who had left the door open. Um, he says, um, that, that experience of seeing that happen with this one person, he said, that experience caused all of the teachers and the students in that school to join in repentance, prayer, and rededication to God's will as they placed themselves afresh under the protection of Christ's anointing blood. And what I took out of that is that same thing with this article that I started with. There's things that if we're not careful, we're going to compromise on. And Satan's looking for our windows of compromise. He's looking for the windows for us to get in. And what, what is not popular right now, and, I, and it's interesting how uh, we've come to this point and over the last three or four weeks, conversations I've had, stuff like that, that Christians, some, there, are, there, are, there are people who I absolutely know are saved. There are people who I know who are absolutely saved who want the convenience of being able to do what I want to do when I want to do it. And I keep going back to, and I really have been processing that. And, I, and, and the thing that I snapped for me and grabbed it was, Jesus said, deny yourself, take up your cross and yes. follow me. Right. This is not about, and, it, and it, trust me, nobody loves their convenience and comfort more than me. I love my comfort and I love my convenience. But if Jesus said this there are things that you have to deny yourself with and having my, my own comfort or, or, or what I want when I want it kind of thing, if that's part of it, then what do I love more? You know? And you go back to what did Peter, what did Jesus ask Peter? Do you love me? Peter, you love me. Well, you know I do love you. Okay. He asked him three times. Why? Because he went not. Really? Or do you say it? And I think this is kind of what we're, what we're seeing to me, what we're seeing, we're on the front end because all of this demon heavy cultural stuff that's now there's no safe place, right? There's no place we can run or hide from it. Even the church isn't necessarily the safe place like it used to be where, you know, we didn't have to worry about it because we have to worry about it. You know, we have to worry about compromise and we have to worry about being careful and all that. So even with that, I think the, um, well, bottom line, we, we, have, we have got to, to be on it. And what's coming, we're on the front end, is what I'm trying to say, of, of, of t drawing a line in the sand, getting on one side of it or another. Yes, Ray? We just watched a segment of The Chosen yes? a couple nights ago, and it really brought that out. It, it was, Jesus was all day and way into the evening healing people, casting out demons. You didn't see him doing that. All you saw was the disciples arguing among, them, among themselves about, you know, well, you did this, and I can never forgive you, and blah, blah, blah. And they were sitting around the fire, you know, and eating and arguing with one another. Pretty soon, Jesus comes walking by, and he just wrung out, sweating. And he says, good night, I'm going to bed. And that was the end of it. <laughs> and it's just so plain that, wow, that's us. Wow. You know? Yeah. Yeah. That's great. 
But that is right. I think that we're so, so the church. I'm going back to the church and the conversation we've had before. But I think the church is so wrongly focused on the wrong things. Yeah. How do we look? How's the band sound? How do the lights look? Are the bushes trimmed perfectly? Because <laughs> no, if the bushes aren't trimmed perfectly, nobody's oh, coming back. Yes, Mike. Another thing is, I'm better than him. I know what this guy does. Yeah. And I don't do that. Yeah. You know. Yeah. That's that's not the way I see things. But in in my past, there are things I have a really hard time. Well, I won't ever forget them, but forgiving them. Yeah. And how can I be forgiven if I can't forgive? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know. And, so, and, and that's true, because yeah. Jesus said the standard that we use to judge others, God's going to use that one on us. Mm -hmm. All right? Since you like your standard so much, let's use your standard. We're going to judge you on that standard. All right, all right. So, anybody else on this? We are seeing at a, an incredible incredibly fast increasing rate uh, this whole attack on all that is God all that is good all that the things that and, and what is interesting the, that, that if you look underneath the surface there you see some pushback and I'll throw out uh, you know how I feel about beer so I'm talking more about the, this advertising campaign that that um, uh, Bud Light had, right? And and that that campaign has cost that company billions of dollars, billions with a B, as Paul Harvey used to say. Um, and what I take out of that is, hey, there is a little bit of hope because people are going, I'm not buying this. I'm not not the product. I'm not buying the whole premise of this thing. Yeah. Yeah, you've got Target though. That yeah. Down <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and Target, Target um, here today, supposedly, has told their stores put don't take it down, just put it to the back of the store. Yeah. At least until until this thing blows over, right, or whatever it happens to be, who knows? But yeah, so Target in there, they saw what had happened, and they were starting to get some heat, and so they cut it off at the pass, um, and they're. All of those displays. There was one article said they're going to the back of the store. There's another article I saw that said they're coming down. But my, I don't know what to believe. But I saw the article that they're moving to the back of the store twice. Yeah. So I'm thinking it's going to the back of the store rather than coming down. But the fact is <clears throat> that that tells me there are people who who are saying now, you know. So there there is pushback. There is fight. You know. It's like Elijah. I got seven thousand other people who are on my side. So it's not like all is lost. You know, because there are people who are saying, no, this is, we're not doing this. I'm not going to expose my, I've had people say, I'm not going back to Target. I'm not exposing my kids to this. If this is who they are, I don't want to shop there. So um, I do think that, you know, this is not all doom and gloom from the standpoint, I mean, it's doom and gloom from the standpoint that it's happening at all, but from the standpoint that there are people going now, you know, there's pushback um, to a great deal on some of this. Um, tells you that there are people going no, this is not okay and you know so whether that's on God's terms or not at least there's godly values and character built into it these may not all be Christian people um, hopefully it's all Christian people not buying Bud Light but that's a whole different story um, you know <laughs> I did see this funny funny article Babylon B said Bud Light had done more in one day to get Christians to stop drinking <laughs> Then, then how many sermons or something? I go, that is really funny. <laughs> so, anyway. So, I, I do think, you know, from the standpoint, this is spiritual war. And so, what we're seeing is, that this is not, this is going to be unrelenting. So, let's take a look real quick. Matthew 24, I'm, I'm going to read you from Matthew 24. Go to Genesis chapter 6. You can look up Genesis chapter 6. But I'm going to read you what Jesus said. Matthew 24, but in that day, no one knows. 
or hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father alone. For the coming of the Son of Man will be just like the days of Noah. So when the Bible says something like, just like, my assumption is it's going to be just like. Okay? Just like the days of Noah. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. Can you imagine the wedding day? Oh, my, I'm getting married on this day. This is my wedding day, and all of a sudden it's going to rain. It's raining on my wedding day. <laughs> Just think about that for a second. Um, giving in marriage until the day Noah entered the ark. Verse 39, they did not understand until the flood came. They did not understand until the flood came. They did not understand until the flood came and took them all away. So will the coming of the Son of Man be. So the question is, why did they not understand if Noah was preaching the truth about what was coming? Noah was preaching that whole time. We saw that, right? Noah was preaching. He was building and he was preaching. And it says they did not understand until the flood came. So if they did not understand what Noah was preaching, that it was the truth, well, why didn't they understand that? Well, Genesis chapter 6 opens that up. So let's go look at that real quick. Um, Genesis chapter 6, verses 1 through 8 says, Now it came about, when men began to multiply on the face of the land, and daughters were born to them, that the sons of God, it's talk about demons, angels, fallen angels, the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful, and they took wives for themselves, whomever they chose. Chose. Then the Lord said, My spirit will, shall not always strive with man forever, because he is also, also his flesh. Nevertheless, his days shall be 120 years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days, the giants, and, uh, and also afterwards when the sons of God came to the daughters of men, they bore children to them. These were the mighty men of old, men of renown. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was evil continually. So go back to what Jesus said. They did not understand until the flood came. Why didn't they understand until the flood came? Because, verse 5, the wickedness of man was great on the earth, and every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Verse 6, the Lord was sorry he made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. The Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the earth, from the man to the animals to the creeping things to the birds of the sky. I am sorry that I've made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. So see, all was not lost. There was someone who still found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Someone, Noah was a righteous man. And so there are still righteous people in our land who are saying, no, this is not acceptable. I am not going to partake in all this craziness. But um, I, I, just, I just thought, man, there's the connection right there. They did not understand until the flood came. The reason they didn't understand until the flood came is because they were wicked. Yes. So... Like I mentioned a while ago about the, the last person that accepts Christ, would not the world be like that then at the time at that time? I would think evil in their hearts continually. Yes. So we were talking about uh, what was the word? I lost it. <laughs> uh, our conveniences. Yes. Um, yeah. And, uh, and that would be a thorn in our side at that time. With with the the remnant that's left, things are going to keep changing yes i don't know how long right or, or if it'll pause or go on i don't know but it's not going to be well the shakings will continue so yes. john using jonathan khan's terminology here shakings are going to continue the shakings are happening because god is trying to get people to to come back to him god is trying to get people his heart he's always seeking the heart of, of people to come back to him Come back to the Father. He does not want any to perish, which tells us what? Not everyone is going to heaven. There are going to be people who perish because they've not made the connection with Jesus Christ, through Jesus Christ, back to the Father. You, the only way to the Father is through the Son. Mm -hmm. and, 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 the, and that is to believe in your heart, confess with your mouth, be bapt, repent, be baptized, pick up your, deny yourself, pick up your cross and follow him. All this that we're seeing now is because of the breakup of the family, and and it, it talks about you know uh, bring up how teaching your young while they're you know, 
my mind going. That's raised a, no, them up in the ways of the Lord. There you go. Yep. And yes. when they were old, they would not depart from him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. And so we've failed in that. And what we're seeing, that's that's been happening now for a long time. Yes. What we're seeing now is the fruit of it. And it's just coming out of the woodwork. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, mm -hmm. and, and there's a handoff. There's supposed to be a handoff. Psalms and Proverbs talk about a handoff from one generation to another. One generation to yes. tell another, this is what God did for us. And that goes back clear to, to Deuteronomy. Yep. says, when your children ask, well, why do we have to do all this stuff? You tell them. This is what happened is God brought us out of slavery. He, he led us across the Red Sea. This is what God did for us. And you tell them what exactly. God did for you. And how many families have told their children, this is what God has done for me? Yep. Yep. I think I told you guys, I, um, in Hannibal a couple weeks ago, there's a group of girls there who their parents made them come. And this one little 16-year-old girl was really upset because if she didn't come, she was going to lose her phone privileges. <laughs> she sat there kind of unmoved. And I was just, that the Holy Spirit was, was really moving in that revival. And uh, it was just, it was just awesome. And I, and I was just drawn to these girls. And I had said to them, I said, girls, I want to give you, I want to give you the right you go ask anybody in this room, you go ask anybody you know who says that they're a follower of Jesus Christ, you ask them why. Why are you a follower of Jesus Christ? And then one little girl looked at me like I was crazy. Uh, and I finally did get her to smile. But I said, you have the right to ask. This is before I even know she, she had her phone privileges taken away from her. I said, you have the right to ask anyone. Why? Why do you believe that? Ask them. Because I think that is right. I, I think I think a young person has the right to say, "Why do you follow this? What 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 is what is the big deal about this?" Because we have the obligation to to hand this off to that generation, and I kind of think we failed, particularly maybe in the last 25, 30 years, because I'm talking about the church as a whole, not individuals, but the church as a whole. We've been so focused on how this thing looks and how it rolls and is the music right and the lights right and all this stuff is right, and we've not talked about the gospel of Jesus Christ. Nearly enough. Not that we have it, but we haven't talked about it. nearly enough. From from that standpoint, and I think we have left people these young a lot of these young people going, What's the, I don't I mean, what's this all about? Well, I, okay, I got coffee. I can get coffee anywhere. I can go to Starbucks and get coffee with an app. <laughs> you guys have an app? <laughs> Thoughts on any of that? I know a lot of older people that you talk to them about some things we've been talking about, and they, they, they'll tell you, I never heard of any of that in church before. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know? That's kind of scary. the Bible? Honest? <laughs> That's kind of scary, isn't it? Yeah. I remember Chris Herman saying that, I don't remember what church she was in, but she said, she mentioned, that, yes, we've been saved. We, we know the Lord. And someone, a member of that church, said, oh, we don't talk about that here. Oh. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, I don't know where that was. I just remember her telling that story. Yeah. Well, kind of what is the point? Yeah. If, if, if we're not about salvation, if we're not about the gospel, the fact that the gospel can change your life and turn it around, yeah. if we're not about that, what is the point? Amen. Yeah, the Samaritan woman at the well, Jesus said, go tell everybody, you know. Yes. What, what's happened? Yes. Yes. He told me everything that I've ever done. Yes. Yes. So I want to wrap up tonight in, in the book of Jude. It is one chapter. I love the book of Jude. I just love it. There's a couple of things here kind of that will wrap up um, kind of, uh, at least this discussion. And I'll, I'll make you this promise. I need to do a bit more study on this issue of possession and and some of these i i am i am i realize okay i've got to dig deeper and i need to go a different direction so i can't dig deeper right now so through the summer i'm going to dig deeper and probably at the, on the back end of the summer we get into the fall maybe um, we can go a little bit deeper because this book there's a lot more in this book than we've covered um the Dr. Ed Murphy's book, uh, Handbook for Spiritual Warfare, there's a lot of stuff in that that is so deep and wide. Yeah. And there's so much happening right now um, in our culture that is demonically infused 
And so I, I, I throw this book out. If you've not read this book, uh, Return of the Gods by Jonathan Kahn, read it. He's got some great videos on his YouTube channel as well. And I just saw today he's got a new book coming out here very soon. So I can't wait to find out what that one's about. But I would, I would challenge you this summer to, to, to dig into this a little yourself and, 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 and get deeper on this. And I'm, I will promise you I will do that as well. Um, but Jude, let me, let me read to you about Jude because there's a couple of things here. So one of the things about those demons that, that in, in pre-flood, that, it, that basically what, what had happened there, there was demon-possessed humans. And they were cohabitating, creating demon-possessed children, essentially. How did the whole earth get that corrupt? Well, that's how the whole earth got corrupt. And Jude tells us what happened to those demons. So we're going to see that here and Jude in just a second. And I was just going to read a couple of verses, but shoot, it's only 25 verses and I love it. I love this little book. So we're going to read the whole thing to finish up tonight. It says this, Jude Verse 1, Jude, a bond servant of Jesus Christ. By the way, a bond servant means I don't make my own decisions. Jesus makes them for me. A bond servant is at the discretion of the owner of that servant or the one who they are serving. And he says, I am in, 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 I am in, uh, in servanthood to Jesus Christ, a bond servant of Jesus Christ and the brother of James to, who, though, to those who are, are the called Beloved in God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ. May mercy and peace and love be multiplied to you. Beloved, while I was making every effort to write you about our common salvation, I felt it necessary to write to you appealing that you contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all handed down to the saints. Let me give you a, con let me give you a translation there. The Lord changed my message this morning. <laughs> That's essentially what he's saying. He said, I was going to write to you about something else, but, but here's what the Lord told me to, to write to you. It's, it's like a preacher getting up on Sunday morning and going, well, I was going to tell you this, but the Lord changed my message this morning. And that's exactly what this is. So look, go down verse four there. It says, for certain persons have crept in unnoticed. Those who were long beforehand marked out for this condemnation, ungodly persons, who turn the grace of our God into licentiousness and deny our only Master and Lord Jesus Christ. Well, look at that. Whoa. What did that say? It's, mine, uh, reads, mine reads a little different. Yeah, read, no, read yours. No, Go ahead. Well, uh, I like yours. They are ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into a license for immorality and deny Jesus Christ, our only Sovereign and Lord. It, yeah. Breaches. I mean, that's kind of what's happening now. So it's like, we're, and I've heard uh, uh, Chuck Swindoll put it this way. He said they cheapen grace because they want to live what they want to live. They want to do what they want to do. And does grace cover? Well, yeah, grace covers, but that's a cheap grace. That's not what God intended at all, right? They're, so they're, they want to they, they, they want to live the way they want to live. So they want one foot on either side of the line, if you want to put it that way. You it's know? like the fig tree that didn't produce any fruit. fruit yeah. And Jesus cursed it and it died. Exactly. Exactly. Again, I would hold this out as evidence that says there is a place where you are either in or out. And if you're in out, Jesus is saying you're not producing fruit. And he's clear about what he does with that. He cuts it off and it's burned because it's not doing anything for the kingdom. There comes a point. It's not all, you know, you go as long as you can with a fruit tree. Sooner or later, I don't want that thing to produce. But at some point, you just go, it's never going to produce. It's out. It's taking up space. Anybody else? Verse 5, now I desire to remind you, though you know all things once for all, that the Lord, after saving people out of the land of Egypt, subsequently destroyed those who did not believe. Verse 6, and angels who did not keep their own domain, but abandoned their proper abode, he has kept in eternal bonds under darkness for the judgment of the great day. That's what uh, theol theologians I'll say that is the the angels, those fallen demons that that in Genesis six. I've heard that connection before too, and I'm, I'm that's where I'm going. That 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 uh, um, it, it also. I mean, there's angels that the, the fallen angels, and he's kept, you know, that that are that the third of heaven fell. But there's a group that has been kept in eternal bonds now, and I've heard, and I can't remember Ray. Um, 
I'll have to look that up where I've heard this that teaching before, but that that um, so that they would not do that again. That yeah. they're they're yeah. they're bound now up until the day of judgment. So that's I wanted to bring that connection out. Verse seven: Just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them, since they in the same way as these indulged in gross immorality and went after strange flesh are exhibited as an example of undergoing the punishment of eternal fire. Yet in the same way, these men also by dreaming defile the flesh and reject authority and revile angelic majesties. But Michael, the archangel, when he uh, disputed with the devil and argued about the body of Moses, did not dare pronounce against him a railing judgment, but he said, the Lord rebuke you. But these men revile the things which they do not understand and the things which they know by instinct, like unreasoning animal, by these things they are destroyed. Woe to them, for they have gone the way of Cain and pay, uh, uh, and for pay they have rushed headlong into the, bear, at the era of Balaam and perished in the rebellion of Korah. These are men who are hidden reefs in your love fe feasts. And when they feast, uh, with you without fear, caring for themselves, clouds without water, carried along by winds, autumn trees without fruit, doubly dead, uprooted, wild waves of the sea, casting up their own shame like foam, wandering stars for whom the black darkness has been reserved forever. It was about these men that Enoch, in the seventh generation from Adam, prophesied, saying, Behold, the Lord came with many thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment upon all and to convict all the ungodly of their ungodly deeds, which they have done in an ungodly way, and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These are grumblers, finding fault, following after their own lusts. They speak arrogantly, flattering people for the sake of gaining an advantage. But you, beloved, ought to remember the words that were spoken beforehand by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. That they were saying to you, in the last time, there will be mockers following after their own ungodly lusts. These are the ones who cause divisions, worldly-minded, devoid of the Spirit, verse 20. But you, beloved building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting anxiously for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to eternal life. Verse 22, love this verse. Have mercy on some who are doubting. Save others. That's, he's telling us, you save others. You save them by snatching them out of the fire. And on some have mercy with fear, hating even the garment polluted by the flesh. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless with great joy, to the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. I'm glad it's just one chapter. <laughs> He's, wow. I mean, seriously. <laughs> seriously. I mean, he, he lays it out. He does. He lays it out. And, and the layout there is that we have to be focused all the time. And if, we, and if somebody comes in, and like he's talking about these, these, uh, these people, call it out. Don't give them a, you know, call them out on the, on the stuff that is not godly, the stuff that is not aligning, the stuff that is compromising the word of God. Don't give it an inch, because when you give it an inch, look what happens. Yeah. All, these things, all these things come up. We have to be firm. In, in that, and it's not that you want to, because he's saying, well, have mercy on someone who's down. He's not, he said, don't go railing on people. You have to have mercy. And he says, save others, snatch them out of the fire. Well, you, if you're going to get close enough to pull somebody out of the fire, you are going to smell like smoke. Yeah. You have to get that close if you really want to save them. And so that means you got to be close to people and be loving, as loving as you can, Merciful does not mean you're endorsing a wrong. Merciful means I, I get where you're at, but man, you've got to rethink this. If you want to be safe, if you want to be saved, if you, if you want hope to change, you know, that's the kind of, I think that's the kind of mercy, you know. Um, and I, I'll throw this out, Jimmy, because I just, I just watched him the last three nights, or the two nights, preach, and it's like, man. He was so straight up and so loving at the same time. He's saying, "This you gotta, you gotta, 
but at the same time, he's just, he's loving when he does it, you know? And I think that's what he's saying. Have mercy on some who are doubting, you know? They're doubting, but, but be gentle, you know, be merciful. But at the same time, you've got to try to help them out, you know? Do you love them as much as you love yourself? Well, if you were in that place, what would you want? Right. Knowing what you know now. Exactly. But, but the same guy who's saying have mercy on the some who are doubting, He's throwing fire and brimstone at these ones who are, who are, who are of a different mindset, yeah. who are saying one thing and doing something else, who are trying to divert people, who are trying to change people, who are trying to deceive people. Man, he's all over them. So can, you, can both come out of the same fountain? Yeah, absolutely. Both can come out of the same fountain. Yeah. You know? I think he was, he was probably a firebrand in that sense, you know? <laughs> so. well, he was, his brother was who? James. James. Well, so... If you read James, it's just bang, 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 bang. You know, every every few scripture that he's hitting on something else. Yes, it's kind of a shotgun. And and James was the brother, half brother of Jesus Christ, and I think Jude was too, right? Yeah. So I think those. So can you imagine the table talk around that house? Oh my gosh! <laughs> just you're talking about spirited, you know. Mm. But those guys had passion for the, for what they believed, and they and they were they were solid on it. And they, they were not going to compromise truth. But we can be merciful and still not compromise truth. I think this is what, what Jude is saying here. So, any other thoughts on that? Heavy. Heavy. Yeah. Let me leave you with this. Philippians 4, 8 and 9. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence and praise, dwell on these things, think on these things. The things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, Paul is saying this, practice those things and the God of peace will be with you. And go.